Glory to Jesus Christ, Yehoshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior. Father, we give you all the glory. We come before you in your presence and we bow humbly before your majesty. Lord, we thank you because you saved us, having found us to be sinners. You loved us enough to come into this world to indwell a vessel of flesh and die for us. The Son of God died for us. And we thank you, Lord, for this sacrifice. And we want to give you all the honor and the glory and elevate your name and only you, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Yehoshua HaMashiach. Amen. Alleluia. Thank you, Father, for the breath of life, for food, for raiment, and for shelter. Brothers and sisters, we are looking at scripture to deepen our understanding of the nature of our God. Amen. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And so the word God here in the lexicon, if we look in the Greek, it is deity. And so we are talking about a divine being. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Indeed, there is another verse which teaches us that there is no greater love than to die for your brethren. And so, brothers and sisters, this verse is either true or false. And it is true, obviously. We believe in the authority of the Bible and what it says, what it teaches us. And so, if this verse is true, it means that God showed love towards us in that he, he laid down his life for us. And so, this has to hold true. But we also know from John chapter 4, verse 24, that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so the key part here is that God is a spirit. But if God is a spirit, how can he then lay down his life for us? Obviously, he did not die as a spirit, but rather his spirit indwelled a vessel of flesh, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. And the Spirit of God being in the flesh of Jesus Christ, the man, indwelling that vessel of flesh, the vessel of flesh of Jesus Christ died on the cross, and the Spirit of God was indwelling him. And this is how we reconcile the fact that God is spirit in John 4, 24. God is a spirit, and that's how we reconcile this and harmonize it with 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, which teaches us, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he, God, laid down his life for us, understanding that a spirit cannot lay down his life. And, brothers and sisters, the Bible even teaches us this fact, because indeed when we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, we read, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And so the important part here is that God was in Christ. God still being the Spirit, according to John 4.24, the Spirit of God was in Christ. And that Spirit of God being in Christ, and Christ having died on the cross for us, it can in turn be said that, according to 1 John 3.16, God laid down his life for us, while indwelling a vessel of flesh, the mortal flesh of Jesus Christ, the man, perished. And that's how God laid down his life, because he was the spirit indwelling that vessel of flesh. And so this is the first aspect that we are going to outline 
God being a spirit, indwelled a vessel of flesh, the body of Jesus Christ, the man. And God did this being a spirit, indwelling the vessel of flesh of Jesus Christ, the man. And the scriptures confirm it by telling us, to wit, that God was in Christ. Because obviously the spirit of God cannot die so that he would have laid down his life. And so, brothers and sisters, in order to shed light on this process by which a body dies, just to bring clarity to this situation, we turn momentarily to James chapter 2, verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. We know in the Bible that there are two types of death. There is the first death, the natural death, which is the body perishing, and the spirit is released. Indeed, the Bible tells us that when men die and the flesh has perished, the spirit goes back to God who gave it. In other words, the spirit departs from the flesh that has perished. And so, as the body without the spirit is dead, and so this is natural death, the body perishes, and the spirit is released so that the body, the flesh, is without the spirit. And this is the death that the Lord experienced. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, the man, indwelled by the spirit of God, God being a spirit, when the body of Christ, the flesh, the vessel in which the spirit of God was indwelling, when that flesh perished on the cross, the Spirit of God was released. But God, having indwelled that vessel of flesh, the flesh of Jesus Christ, it can then be said that indeed God laid down his life and that the vessel of flesh that he was occupying, well, that vessel of flesh, the body of Christ, perished on the cross. And so it is a natural death that occurred on the cross where the body perished and the Spirit was released such that without the Spirit of God any longer dwelling in the flesh of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ perished. And that's how he gave up the ghost. The ghost departed from the flesh. So that's James 2.26. And some might say that there is a second type of death that we should consider, and that is spiritual death. This second death is the eternal separation between a spirit and God, who is also a spirit. So your spirit is separated from the spirit of God eternally. And that is the second death. We read about this in the book of Revelation, when we learn that those who will not be found to be in the book of life, they will be cast in the lake of fire. And we know that death and hell are also going to be cast into the lake of fire. And this condemnation, which is eternal, this is the second death. And so let us read it. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And so this is the second death. When the spirit is condemned eternally to the lake of fire and therefore eternally separated from the presence of God. Now, obviously, this is not the death that God suffered when he laid down his life for us, according to 1 John 3.16, because the Spirit of God is not going to be separated 
from himself for cause of wickedness, for cause of being judged and found to be evil. And further, we see that these spirits are standing before God at the time of judgment. And so God himself will rather be judging the souls that are to perish and not himself who should perish because he should not perish. God is holy, God is light, and in him is no darkness. And so the second death, the spiritual death, does not apply to God. And therefore, it leaves open only the first possibility, which is found in James chapter 2, verse 26, the natural death. And this is the death that is spoken about in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, we read again, that hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, if you look at the more recent versions of the Bible, this part is taken out, the part that specifies that it is God who laid down his life for us because it is a truth that is being fought and they are trying to hide it. And so this is why it's important to verify earlier versions of the text to find out that it is the love of God by which he laid down his life for us that we are speaking about. And so it is important to understand that God laid down his life, which lets us understand that his spirit was in Christ, as 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 establishes, to wit, that God was in Christ. However, we have to understand he was a spirit because he is a spirit according to John chapter 4, verse 24. And when Christ, the man, died on the cross, indwelled by the spirit of God, he suffered the first death, the natural death, where the spirit departs from the body that has perished, the flesh that has perished. And this is what we explained using the verse found in James chapter 2, James 2, 26, where it is said that as the body without the spirit is dead. And we further excluded the possibility that God would have laid down his life and therefore perished in the sense of eternal separation from God, because we are not talking about condemnation, eternal condemnation for cause of having been found a sinner. We know God is not a sinner, and we know that these souls being judged there are being judged by God himself. And so therefore, the first death is in play, and it was God indwelling the body of Christ. Christ, the man who died at the cross, indwelt by the Spirit of God, indwelt by the Spirit of the Father. And Jesus Christ, the man indwelt by the Spirit of God, is the Son of God who partook in the things of the flesh. So now that we have clarified this first aspect of the Spirit of God indwelling a vessel of flesh, the flesh of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and that God is a spirit and that he was in Christ as a spirit, we now go to another aspect of this study. Since it is the Spirit of God that is indwelling in the body of Christ, we also must remember that the Bible tells us something very important. For in him, in Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And when you look at the Greek in the lexicon, you will see that fullness means repletion, completion, what is filled. And so the vessel that was Jesus Christ, his flesh. It was full, complete, filled to the brim, if you will, of the Godhead bodily. Now, Godhead means divinity, deity. And so the term Godhead, unfortunately, has been introduced by the translators. And it creates confusion because Godhead can lead certain people to think about a structure in which you can insert different elements, different ideas, different components. And that's where 
the aspect of seeing God as Trinitarian or triune comes in, unfortunately. But Godhead is not a word that was used originally. It is a word that has been used in translation according to a man's thought. But what the scriptures say literally is that for in him, in Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the divinity, of the deity, bodily. And this is the idea conveyed in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, to wit, God was in Christ. And Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, simply comes in to tell us that it was the fullness of God, the fullness of the Father, dwelling bodily in the flesh of Jesus Christ, in the body of Jesus Christ, the man, the Son of God, a vessel of flesh indwelled by the Spirit of God, by the Spirit of the Father. And in that form, where the Spirit of God indwelled a vessel of flesh, that was the Son of God who partook in the things of the flesh. And that Son of God, the man Jesus Christ, he was indwelled by the fullness of deity, the fullness of the Spirit of God. And why is that relevant? Well, because we know that we are also filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with the Spirit of God. But what's the difference between us and Christ? The difference between us and Christ is that we have the Spirit by measure. John chapter 3, verse 34, For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. And by measure here, if you look at the definition, it means a measure, a limited portion, or a limited degree, to a limited degree. And so Christ had the fullness of the Spirit in him, the Spirit of God, that is, and he didn't have it by measure. Now, that is not saying that we have a portion of the Spirit of God. We also have the Spirit of God. Indeed, when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? We see that the Spirit of God dwells in us. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? The Holy Ghost is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. And so the Holy Ghost... The Spirit of God, it dwells in us. Now, one might say, well, how is it then that Jesus had the fullness of the Spirit? One might think there is confusion there because if we have the Spirit of God and Jesus had the Spirit of God, something that therefore we could by extension be called God because we say that Jesus is God. But there is a difference between the Spirit of God in the way that it operated in the flesh of Jesus Christ and the way that it operates in every other saint. And this is where we understand now what it means that the fullness of the deity was in him. It pertained not to the quantity, meaning that we would have a part of the Spirit and he would have the whole of the Spirit. That's not what this is saying. It's not quantitative. It's not pertaining to quantity, but rather it refers to quality. It is qualitative. And what it is saying is that in Jesus Christ, the Spirit operated to the full extent of the possibilities of its power, which is not the case in us. And so getting back to Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, or better said, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the deity bodily. Meaning he had the spirit, and he had it without limit, without restriction, without measure. Meaning that the power that could be channeled through the spirit, through Jesus Christ, was unlimited and boundless. John 3.34 for he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Now we saw that by measure means he had the fullness of the power 
and there was no limit to the way that God could express and manifest his power through the man Jesus Christ, who was indwelled by the Spirit fully. And the difference with us is that we have the Spirit by measure. How does that manifest, or how can we understand this? So that we do not come to the conclusion that we are God because we have the Spirit of God, as Jesus was God in that he had the Spirit of God. So that we don't come to understand that we should be called God in the same manner that Jesus was because we also have the Holy Spirit. So what's the difference? He had the fullness of the deity. He did not have it by measure, the Spirit. Whereas we ourselves, there are limits to the way that the Spirit operates in us. To get a better understanding of this, we, we have to realize that 1 Corinthians chapter 12, for instance, speaks about the different gifts of the spirits and that they are diverse and they all stem from the same spirit, the spirit of God. But the spirit of God in us, because we have established that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit, of the spirit of God, in us, the spirit will not manifest the full extent and diversity of its power. And so we are channels through which the power of God is manifested, but there are limits in the way that we will manifest this power. It is not boundless within us. So let us read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We will start at verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And these are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. So God works all, but amongst saints, there are differences of administrations and diversities of operations. Verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit without. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the self same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. And the key word here is dividing, meaning that these gifts are separated, divided, and then given to us so that they manifest in the spirit through us. But they don't manifest through us, the saints, in their whole array of possibilities, in the manner that they did without limit in the case of Jesus Christ, who was indwelled by the fullness of the Spirit of God, meaning he was not limited concerning these gifts. He had them all. And therefore, the Spirit of God could work all things through him. There was no limit to the manifestation of power through Jesus Christ. And this brings us to the idea that us being limited concerning the gifts and powers that we can manifest, or that rather God can manifest through us. Therefore, the idea of the body comes into play because we are different members, each with our own abilities, gifts, and the sum of our abilities is going to make up the whole pool of abilities and gifts that can be manifested. But they are spread out throughout the body they are divided amongst us, but Christ had them all. And in that, he had the fullness of the divinity in him. And that's different from us, because in us, it is by measure, in part. Verse 27, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Verse 28, and God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. And so you see here, these are different ministries, aptitudes, talents, powers that one can manifest. And Christ was able 
to display all of that. Through him, all these things were manifested, but it's not the case for us. See, Christ is the apostle with a capital A. Christ is the prophet with a capital P. The spirit of Christ is the spirit of prophecy. He was a teacher, obviously. He taught, even in the synagogues. He certainly performed miracles. He certainly healed the sick, the lame. He certainly was a helper, paying attention to other people's needs and encouraging them, edifying them. When it is mentioned that he came to minister to others and not be ministered to, to be a servant. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. He was able to address many people in different languages. And so Jesus was not limited. And yet when it comes to us, verse 29, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles. No. And so we're limited in terms of the abilities and gifts that we have received to be manifest through us by the Spirit of God in us, not because we don't have the whole Spirit of God. We have His Spirit. We established it earlier by reading 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, and 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, where it says that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit of God dwells in us, not part of it, the Spirit, however, by measure, meaning we don't have the fullness of, of the divinity in us, meaning that we don't have full capacity to be channels through which is manifested the whole extent of the possibilities of the power of the Almighty God, which is why verse 31, covet earnestly the best gifts. You would not be told to do that if you had them all, and so there are some that you don't have, and you will have to ask for them. And yet shew I unto you a more excellent way. So there you go, brothers and sisters. We started out in 1 John 3.16 and pointed out that according to John 4.24, if God laid down his life for us and God is a spirit, he had to do that being in Christ as is established in 2 Corinthians 5.19. He had to do that by using the mechanism of the first death, the natural death, Spoken of in James chapter 2, verse 26. The body without the spirit is dead. And so when the spirit of God removed from the body, the flesh of Jesus Christ, the man, the son of God, who was indwelt by the spirit of God, when the spirit of God departed, the flesh of Christ was dead. And it was certainly not the second death that God would have been concerned with in terms of laying down his life because the second death applies to eternal condemnation for those souls that have been found to not have known the Lord, to not have had a relationship with God, and to have died in their sins. Those who choose rebellion, those who at the time of judgment are found to be enemies of God, and concerning whom he has reserved wrath. By way of the fire, that cannot be quenched. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so this natural death where the flesh perishes and the body is without the soul, without the spirit, that body is therefore dead. The flesh of Christ died on the cross. When the spirit departed, the spirit of God. And Christ was indwelled, as we saw, by the fullness of the divinity bodily. Because he did not have, according to John 3, 34, the spirit by measure. And we also saw that according to 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 1 Corinthians 6, 19, that we are indeed vessels in which the spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, dwells. However, that doesn't put us in the same situation as Jesus to say that we would be God in the sense that we did not have the fullness of of the Spirit of God in us, we have it by measure so that we can only manifest part of the totality of the powers of Christ. God cannot, through us, channel all the possibilities of his power. And so we are channels that are limited. There is a limit 
to the power that can be channeled through us as vessels. And so we explored 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and realized that among all the gifts and all the powers of the Spirit, that self-same Spirit does not operate in each and every one of us in the same way, nor to the full extent of the capacities of the Almighty. But in Jesus Christ, it was the case because he doesn't have the Spirit by measure, and the fullness of the deity is therefore told to be in him, indwelling the flesh of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so the Son of God, Jesus Christ the man, he is indwelt by the fullness of the Spirit of God, of the Spirit of the Father. Here we wanted to focus and really expand on 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, and make it clear that when God laid down his life, God being a spirit, he did it through the flesh of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was indwelled by the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Father, and that he had that spirit, not by measure, but had the fullness of it, as we saw from Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, and that we rather are limited in terms of what power can be manifested through us, the saints. We're not the same as Jesus Christ in terms of manifesting the power of God. Even though, as we established, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost, of the Spirit of God. And so there you have it, brothers and sisters. Now you understand better that the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Father, indwelled the vessel of flesh, Jesus Christ, the man, and that the Spirit of God indwelling the flesh of Jesus Christ, this is the Son of God, because God is a spirit, and as the Bible establishes, God, the Spirit, was in Christ, the man. And we know that the man, Jesus Christ, is the Son of God. May you be blessed, brothers and sisters, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen.